I'm John Zavishlock with the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture Cooperative Extension Service. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the more unusual aspects of honeybee genetics. Honeybees and other members of the Hymenoptera utilize an unusual genetic system known as haplodiploidy sex determination. Now the female honeybees, the workers and the queen bees, have 16 pairs of chromosomes. This is a diploid condition. They get 16 from their mother and 16 from their father for a total of 32. Now with Mendel's law of segregation and independent assortment, we can predict that these 16 pairs of chromosomes will randomly separate independently during gamete production with a total possible number of outcomes being 2 to the 16th power, or 65,536. This means that each egg that a queen bee produces possesses any one of these possible unique combinations of chromosomes. Male honeybees, by contrast, have 16 chromosomes. They only have one copy of each gene because they develop from an unfertilized egg, and this is called a haploid condition. All of their DNA comes from their mother. They don't have a father, but they do have a grandfather because their mother had a father. Now drones produce millions of identical gametes. Their sperm cells form without undergoing reduction division. So with haplodiploidy sex determination, it would seem that it's the number of chromosomes that determines whether a honeybee develops into a male or female. And this is a simple answer, and it's basically true, but it can be somewhat more complex. Among honeybees, gender is actually determined by the condition of a single gene at a particular locus on one of the chromosomes. And there may be 20 or more alleles or forms of this particular gene in the honeybee gene pool. So one copy of this gene comes from the queen bee. Another copy will come from the drone bee. Now when these two genes are different alleles, then this is known as a heterozygous condition. Now if the queen bee and the drone both pass along identical alleles, then this is known as a homozygous condition. But with honeybees, we also have a third condition where there is only a single copy of the gene at all. And this is known as a hemizygous condition. Now, if the gene is heterozygous for this trait, it will develop into a female bee. It will become a worker or potentially a new queen bee. There is no genetic difference between a worker and a queen bee. These differences are influenced by diet at a very early stage in their larval development. This hemizygous condition occurs when an unfertilized egg develops into a male bee, or a drone. If a fertilized egg has a homozygous condition, then the result will be a drone, but it will be a diploid drone. This drone has two copies of every gene. Now, diploid drones are rare, and they are functionally infertile. Because their gametes won't undergo meiosis, or reduction division, then they would produce diploid sperm. And so if these drones were to mate successfully with a queen bee, they would produce triploid offspring with three copies of each gene. Although triploid bees could be reared in a laboratory, in a healthy hive, they're typically culled out by the worker bees. The nurse bees that tend to all the brood can sense that there's something odd about these larvae, and they will remove them at a very early stage of development. Diploid drones rarely occur in nature unless a queen bee mates with a closely related drone, such as one of her brothers or a very close cousin. And honeybees have a number of innate behaviors that select against inbred populations, such as the tendency of the queen bee to fly much further from the hive than drones when seeking mates. Now sometimes a beekeeper may encounter a colony with a very poor brood pattern. Although the colony does not appear to be diseased, they may conclude that the queen is of very poor quality. Actually, the queen bee may be doing a great job of laying eggs in every single cell, but the worker bees are busy removing the larvae that are substandard, 
And this is why inbreeding in honeybees is said to result in a very poor brood pattern. Inbreeding is certainly a close form of kinship, although not one that we want to encourage. Biologists use this term kinship selection for the idea that an organism will favor the well-being and survival of its own close relatives over unrelated members of its species, even at the cost of the individual's own survival. Now this idea of altruistic behavior has puzzled many evolutionary biologists. They have wondered how or why a behavior could evolve that is detrimental to one's own survival. Now this idea also assumes that animals recognize their kinship to one another. So let's examine how honeybees in a colony may be related to each other. Humans reproduce with genetic symmetry. That is, each child gets 50% of its genetic material from each of its parents. And since we share 50% identical DNA with each of our parents, we are 50% related to each one. Humans also share some identical DNA with each sibling. We share on average about 50% of our DNA with each of our siblings. That's about 25% of our genes from one's father and 25% of the genes from one's mother are generally shared identically. If we have multiple siblings, we still share some 50% identical genes with each one, but the particular genes that you have in common with each of your siblings may not be the same. Again, this is due to Mendel's law of independent assortment. Now, human beings have 23 chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. So this means that there are two to the 23rd possible combinations for chromosomal assortment. Or that means that for each human gamete that's produced, there are 8,388,608 possible ways for those homologous chromosomes to line up and sort themselves out when forming gametes. So if anyone has ever told you that you were one in a million, don't let them sell you short. If you were merely one in a million, then in a world of six billion people, there would be 6,000 folks exactly like you. In fact, out of all the many possible genetic combinations that each one of your parents could have produced, the odds that you wound up with your exact particular assortment of genetic traits is really 70 trillion, 368 billion, 744 million, 177,644. Or this number squared. These are the odds that you became you. Now, by contrast, haplodiploidy sex determination produces genetic asymmetry, and the relationships between individuals in one family can be a little bit more difficult to understand. A queen bee and a drone bee produce worker offspring, but a queen is likely to mate with numerous drones. The most recent research suggests an average of about 14 different times. Now, this queen bee mixes and stores the genetic contribution of all these drones in a special organ in her abdomen called a spermatheca. Now, the spermatozoa can remain alive and viable here for several years. This is important for a queen bee who may be laying more than a thousand eggs each day. A queen bee can actually choose whether or not to fertilize each egg that she produces and can therefore determine the ratio of male to female offspring in her colony. So within each colony, there are multiple patrilines fathered by different drones, but there is only one matriline at a time. All the bees in a colony have one mother, their queen bee. Now worker bees within the same patriline share common DNA with each other. On average, they share about 25% of their maternal DNA with each of their sisters, just like humans. They also share 50% identical DNA that they inherit from their father. And this is because their father, the drone, only has half of the number of chromosomes as female bees. And so each drone produces millions of identical sperm, and he passes on an identical copy of his entire genome to each of his offspring. So the workers in the same paternal line actually share 75% of their genes in common with each other. They have a relationship that we call super sisters, and they are 75% related to each other. Likewise, workers in other patrilines share similar relationships to their sisters and to their parents. Worker bees from different patrilines, however, share only 25% identical DNA from their mothers. They don't share any DNA from their different fathers. And so we can call the bees in this relationship subsisters. They share only 25% DNA with each other. Now, if something were to happen to our queen bee in this colony, she were to disappear or die out, 
and the colony was unable to rear a new queen, then some of the worker bees would begin laying eggs. In the absence of the queen and her important pheromones, some of the workers' ovaries would develop and produce eggs, but they would be haploid. She would be unable to mate, and all of the offspring that she would produce would be drones. Now, this entire colony would begin to die out. As it fills up with drones, the worker bees are dying of old age, and uh, there are no more bees bringing in any food. Now, the entire colony will begin to, uh, to die out, and this is probably the colony's last effort to get their family genetics out into the world to hopefully carry on as a patriline in another colony somewhere else. So let's look at the particular relationships again within the hive, and let's pay attention to one specific individual. So we have a queen bee, and we have several drone lines, as well as worker and drone offspring. Now this worker bee is 50% related to her mother, who is 50% related to her. She's also 50% related to her father, who is 100% related to her. This drone has no father. He gets none of his genetics from a father. He's 100% related to his mother, who is only 50% invested in him. Now this brother drone is 25% related to our worker bee, the same relationship that she shares with her half-sisters and other petrolines. But she is 75% related to all of her super sisters within her own petroline. Now in the absence of a queen bee, this worker could become a laying worker. And then she would be 50% related to each of the drone offspring that she could produce. And each of her sons would be 100% related to her. However, if she were to help select one of her own super sisters to rear as the new queen, then that queen would have the same relationship to its offspring, as we saw before, 50% to each son and each daughter, and our worker would then be 37.5% related to each of her nieces and nephews. If one of the subsisters was raised to become the next queen bee, then it would have the same relationship to its own offspring, as we saw before, 50% to each, but our worker bee would only be 12.5% related to the resulting offspring that would soon take over the entire colony within the next generation. Now, if one of her drone offspring were to successfully mate with another queen outside the hive, then they could produce more workers in another colony. And then our particular worker would be 50% related to each of her granddaughters because her son would pass on all of his genes that he got from her. So while it sounds complex at first, you can see that the genetic relationship between individual honeybees is actually really simple to establish. Perhaps though, it still begs the question, why? Why would such a convoluted process develop in the first place? If the contest of biological fitness is to pass on as many copies of one's own genes as possible, then why would worker bees give up their own reproduction in order to help their queen raise more sisters and brothers? Why would an individual choose to help raise brothers, which they are less related to, instead of their own sons to whom they would be more related? And likewise, why should she raise nieces and nephews instead of her own sons and granddaughters? Well, it's a numbers game, and actually the numbers do add up. Because a worker bee is more closely related to her super sisters than she is to her own parents or her own offspring, this close bond helps to reinforce the social structure within the bee colony and makes them much more inclined to care for one another. Also consider that drones have very low odds of successfully mating. Fewer than one in a thousand drones will ever find an available queen, and that's probably a fairly conservative estimate given the number of drones and the number of virgin queens that an average bee colony produces each year. And even if that drone is successful, he will on average maybe be one of a dozen or so different drones that that particular queen may couple with, and so he will only be the father of about 8% of the workers in the resulting colony. So, for each drone that our worker bee may produce, it's going to have less than a 0.1% chance of passing on 50% of its genes to a mere 8% of another colony and that gets to be very low odds. So, by helping her full sister to become the next queen bee, our worker bee is 37.5% related to all the bees in her hive. And even if one of her half-sisters 
becomes the next queen, she is still related to 12.5% of all of them. So by supporting her sisters and nieces, a worker bee has a much higher probability that more copies of her own genes will be passed on to the next generation than if she were to have her own offspring. So this division of labor into specialized reproductive and worker caste has been a good strategy for bees. It allows a colony of social bees to grow to a very large population, unlike the many species of solitary bees that are limited in population size because each female bee must rear all of her own offspring individually. Now, the same system of genetics is employed by wasps and by ants and has contributed to their becoming some of the most successful insect groups on the planet.